Hello everyone. So if you've taken a plane, perhaps a little bit less this year, you will all be familiar with the sign that says prepare for security, leave your liquids, and it also says gels, creams, pastes, and all sorts of other things. So what I'm going to tell you about today is what all the stuff that you leave in the box at security have in common. And it's not going to be so much about the liquids, but the rest that is softer and that we call soft matter. So my name is Cecile. I'm a chemical engineer, although I'd probably describe myself these days as a physical chemist, and I'm a soft matter scientist. So what I'm really interested in doing in my research is looking at the very, very, very small uh, sort of nanometer length scale that's uh, a million times smaller than a millimeter and trying to understand how the structure at this very, very, very small scale affects the behavior of material. So basically how materials deform or flow when we squeeze them or spread them or pour them. So to start with, what is soft matter? So soft matter is really just materials that are made of molecules, but these molecules are interacting through quite weak interactions that we call physical interactions. So you've probably heard about chemical interactions or chemical bonds. They are the really strong ones that connect the atoms together in the molecule. In soft matter, it's really the way these molecules are then assembled into other structures through these weak physical interactions. Um, so that makes soft matter. But soft matter also is the stuff that you spread on your face, on your hair, on your body, that you brush your teeth with, and the stuff that you put through your mouth. Food, basically, or lots of foods at least. So here is something you can do at home. Look for the soft matter stuff that's around you and think about how they behave when you squeeze them or scoop them or spread them. It's all down to how the molecules are organized at the very small scale. So now you know that you've always known about soft matter without knowing that you knew about it. Still, uh, what is it made of? Um, how are the molecules organized and what molecules are they? And basically, in other words, what is the common thing between the cream you spread on your body, your shower gel, margarine or jelly dessert? So I'm going to tell you about two uh, very, very important components of soft matter. So the first really important character in this play of soft matter are surfactants, and you may know them under the name of detergents, although that's not completely exactly the same thing, but it's, yeah, so that's what you have in your laundry liquid, in your um, washing liquid, in your shower gels, all sorts of things. So what's really peculiar about surfactants is they have um, a dual personality. So they have a hydrophilic head group, so water-loving head group, and a hydrophobic tail. And these two are connected by chemical bonds, so they cannot separate. So because of this uh, very unusual structure, surfactants like to adsorb at interfaces. So basically, they're very good at stabilizing oil-water interfaces because one part that loves oil and hates water will be in the oil and the other part will be in the water. And this is how you clean dirt, I mean, your clothes, the fat in, on dishes uh, or, or your body or, you know, your hair. Uh, so that's quite convenient. Um, how do you think these molecules behave when we throw them in water? I mean, how do they resolve that conflict in their uh, complex personality? Well, basically, when we throw them in water, the part that hates water and wants to avoid water just goes inside and on the outside stay the part that loves water. And we end up with a structure that looks a little bit like a pom-pom. Uh, so with the hydrophobic bits in the middle and the hydrophilic uh, head group on the outside. Of course, uh, downsize 
about 10 million times. Okay, we're, we're talking really, really small things. And so this structure is very useful, as we said, just to clean all the dirty stuff, but you can also use it to encapsulate um, perfumes, uh, fragrant oils, uh, flavors. You can also use it to encapsulate drugs. And in fact, that's used in, in a lot of your uh, medicine formulations. Uh, so if you check some of the labels, you'll find lots of surfactants. Um, what other cool stuff about surfactants I can tell you? So we also have lots and lots of surfactants in our body. So we have surfactants in our lungs, they help us breathe. Uh, and we have surfactants called bile salts uh, in our uh, digestive system that helps us uh, digest fat. So um, I, in my research, I spend a lot of time looking at bile salts. And so uh, bile salts form um, my cells that you know, vaguely look like this, uh, where they encapsulate the, the broken down um, directory lipids, so the fat that we eat, and help transport it to the gut mucosa where it will be absorbed by the body. So surfactants are really everywhere. Here is something you can do at home. I'm trying to mix oil and water, which of course is not possible unless you add surfactants. So if you're making a mayonnaise, the surfactants would come from the egg. Here I'm just adding some uh, washing liquid. It's not quite enough because I would need to mix very, very vigorously for the oil droplets to uh, stay stable. But look how the sample look different. So the second um, really important component of um, soft stuff around you are polymers. And uh, probably when you hear the word polymer, you think about plastics, um, you might think about Teflon that uh, lie your, your pans or uh, polyesters in clothes or um, other things like this. But there are actually polymers everywhere. So there are lots of natural polymers. So uh, polysaccharides in particular, they are um, chains of sugars and they make up most of our diet. So starch is a polymer. Uh, cellulose is a polymer, that's the main component in, in plants, um, and it's everywhere in our body. So uh, collagen that make up our, our flesh or, or what we call the extracellular matrix, that's all the stuff that is uh, around cells and again basically that make up our flesh um, is, is, a, is a protein and therefore a polymer and DNA also is a polymer. So. Um, a polymer is a very long molecule, so again, down size uh, many, many uh, times. Um, and when it's in water, it tends to form some sort of coil like this. And um, it's made of repeated un repeating units. So if you have a protein, for instance, the repeating units are going to be amino acids. But depending on the chemical structure, then the polymer will have a very different uh, property. And if you think about taking another polymer and making a chemical bond, so the very strong bonds that connect um, molecules together, but you know, if you're connecting uh, polymer chains instead of small molecules, you may end up with uh, a structure that uh, looks like this, um, you know, with polymer chains connected together in water. And that is uh, the structure of a gel. So this is a, a model for, um, you know, for your jelly dessert, for um, your hair gel or, you know, other types of gels that you may encounter. And so these, these molecules are, are very helpful for, for lots of uh, applications. You find them in nappies, for instance, you know, why nappies can uh, contain so much liquid is because you have some sort of gel that swells uh, when it's contact with the urine. Um, but there are also all sorts of um, much fancier uh, application um, in, in biomedicine, for instance. So we use uh, polymer gels for what we call tissue engineering. So that's about repairing the body, repairing tissues. And uh, why we can use gels for that is because gels have a structure very similar in terms of the environment, in terms of the chains that are connected together, in terms of the mechanical properties, so how they deform, very similar 
to um, you know to to our flesh, and and you can design gels that are going to mimic or resemble uh, different parts of our body. So whether it's uh, you know a soft tissue or harder tissue, you can uh, change the the properties of the gels to mimic that. And this is why we need to understand the structure of these materials, but then also how they're going to deform, how they're going to flow. So this is, you know, part of what I do as a researcher. Here I'm testing a nappy. As you can see, the nappy absorbs all the water. Let's have a look at what's inside. So it's little bits of gel which come from the polymer that was inside the nappy. So I hope that uh, by now you know just a little bit more about the the stuff that make up the soft stuff that you um, you know put on your body or eat or wash your clothes with. Um, and I hope you're a little bit curious to hear more about these molecules and, and how they're organized at the very, very uh, small scale. And uh, you might have ended up thinking that I spent my days making toothpaste or um, gummy bears or um, yeah, but that's not the case. Um, so if you want to hear more about the, the techniques that I use in, in my lab to look uh, you know, at things at the very, very small scale or to understand how things uh, flow and deform, please join the conversation next next week with uh, Soapbox Science. And um, please also post um, questions on my Padlet. So it's just like uh, posting uh, po post-it uh, notes. So just ask anything, you know, uh, how can you use gels to repair the body? Uh, you know, how do you look at molecules at this length scale? Or, um, you know, how do we d digest fat with bile salts or, you know, whatever. Uh, you can also do that on Twitter uh, with the hashtag um, everyday soft stuff. Thank you for watching. Hi everybody, thank you for joining me for Soapbox Science. I'm Molly Boom. I'm a research fellow at the Zoological Society of London's Institute of Zoology. And today I thought I'd record this video from my local park because A, why not? And B, well, everything in 2020 has just been this tiny little bit different, hasn't it? So now when I don't video talks in my local park, which is quite often, I am researching how nature is doing worldwide or to use a bit more science speak, our research group at ZSL is monitoring global biodiversity. How are the world's living things, animal, plants, fungi, that's what we refer to as biodiversity. How are they doing? Are they doing okay? And if not, why are they not doing okay? What are the threats to them and what do we need to do about fixing these threats so that biodiversity or species can thrive in our world? Now, first of all, the big question, how is biodiversity doing worldwide? How are species doing? You're probably, you've probably heard about threatened species or declines in wildlife populations in the, in the news. Um, so it might not come to you as a big shock when I tell you that wildlife overall isn't doing great. But how do we know that wildlife isn't doing great? And how do we put this into numbers? Because that's what scientists do, right? We like to take some data, some observations and put this into numbers and, and make sense of them. Now, quite often scientists have a very specific study species that they're focusing their work on. I used to study badgers, for example. Um, other scientists may go to the same patch of wood or this, to the same park, much like this one here, um, to regularly count the number of certain species. Birds, for example, like that slightly judgmental magpie over there that keeps staring at me, um, or the number of butterflies they come across, the type of species they come across. Or they may use camera traps for more elusive species to monitor those. Or for a marine biologists, they might take a boat out um, onto the sea and, and count whale sightings, for example. Now, what I research is the global picture of how nature is doing worldwide. So I don't look specifically at specific species in the field. What we do is we collate information that was gathered by other species experts, by ecologists. Um, other scientists 
uh, to mash all of this information together into essentially one measure that tells us something about the health of nature or the status and trends of nature over time. And that's, and that's a big word alert, is what we call a biodiversity indicator. Now my work particularly focuses on one specific biodiversity indicator which looks at the extinction risk of species. Now how do we know if a species is at a higher extinction risk than another species? For example, we've all heard about species being close to extinction in the news, but how do scientists know that? Now we know, for example, that some species, and I'm just being stared at by a fox, that some species have large large population numbers. There's many individuals in that species. And so these have a lower extinction risk than species with a small number of individuals. Think of it as the pins in a bowling game. If you've only got few pins and they're ideally close together, so they probably also have a restricted range over which they occur, then a single threat process can easily bowl over all the leftover pins or the leftover individuals in your species. So a small population size and a restricted range lead to a higher extinction risk in species. Now species with population that are declining really, really rapidly, for example, are at a higher risk of extinction because these species are hurtling towards smaller and smaller population sizes and hence higher and higher extinction risk compared to, say, species that have slowly declining populations or stable populations. Now scientists have been assessing the extinction risk of a large number of species for a very, very long time using a scheme that was devised by the International Union for Conservation of Nature, or short IUCN, called the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species. Now the IUCN Red List essentially collates information on these different factors that I was just talking about to categorize the extinction risk of species. Now here you can see the extinction risk scale that the IUCN uses from the lower risk categories, LC here for least concern, the species that have wide ranges, all the way to near threatened, so it's starting to get a little bit more problematic in terms of threats impacting the species, to the threatened categories of vulnerable, endangered, critically endangered, and ultimately to the extinct categories, extinct in the wild and extinct. Now I quite often look at the IUCN Red List process a little bit um, as if it's a game of playing top trumps. You know, the card game where you have cards, I always used to have cards of cars or ships or planes when I was a kid, where each card has a particular type of, of car or ship or plane on it and summarizes some statistics about it. And then the aim of the game is that your card trumps the opponent's card in a particular statistic. Aim is, of course, to win all of the cards. Now you're probably wondering what I'm going on about top trumps what. Now here's an example I made up earlier and it's actually also an example that illustrates some of the species that I've been working on over the past few years. No, nothing, nothing quite cute and fluffy. More things like these guys. Yeah, that works better. The fat mucket and the pink mucket. Now they are both freshwater mussels, so they are invertebrates that live in river systems in North America. Now they look very similar, they're very closely related, so you might think they also have a similar extinction risk. However, let's play top trumps. So let's play red list top trumps. The fat market has a stable population trend, whereas the pink market is decreasing by more than 30%. That means fat market is doing better or has a lower extinction risk than the pink market. Similarly, the fat market has a distribution of more than 5 million kilometers squared. The pink market only 230,000 odd square kilometers. Fat market, least concern. Pink market, vulnerable on the IUCN red list of threatened species. So why do we need to assess the extinction risk of, say, mussels or dung beetles? Because it is these tiny species that A, have been vastly understudied in the past, specifically for conservation. Conservation has traditionally often focused on mammals or birds, for example, and also extinction risk assessments have been carried out for mammals and birds, but much less so for other species. 
And it is also often these tiny species like the mussels or the dung beetles that provide really essential services to our ecosystems and habitats and keep them healthy. Mussels, for example, are really important in filtering a lot of water in freshwater systems, for example, and keeping fresh waters nice and clean. And also by assessing the extinction risk status of these tiny little often overlooked species, and I say tiny and little, and I'm actually going to show quite a big example here. Uh, we're missing out on some really charismatic species that we probably hadn't thought about yet. This guy, for example, the Queen Alexandra's bird wing. Now that is the largest butterfly in the world. Think of a flying dinner plate. It's kind of that size, 25 centimeter wingspan. Now this is a species that occurs in Papua New Guinea and has just recently been assessed by us for the IUCN Red List, assessed as endangered, so the second highest threat category. Now the reason why I am so interested for my research in assessing these lesser known species for the IUCN Red List is the IUCN Red List Index. Now the IUCN Red List Index is essentially what you can see on the screen now. It's, you know, you can see, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six different lines. And they are lines that show us the trend in extinction risk for a number of species groups. So for example, you can see the birds. There's a bird perched on that line. Uh, it's this one up here. That's the group that's currently doing the best out of the ones that have been assessed. Now the point of my research and the research of lots of other people that I collaborate with is to put more points onto this red list graph. Now this is an example that's taken from a recently published paper by, by some of our collaborators at the Natural History Museum which already adds a number of groups to, to this graph that we've just seen. We've got the dragonflies and damselflies, reptiles, plants, and you can see that freshwater crabs and crayfish for example, they're kind of quite low down in terms of their status. They're doing worse than some of the other groups that have already been assessed. And so in a tiny to medium-sized nutshell, this is what my research is trying to do. We're trying to fill the gap in our knowledge for some of these understudied species groups that haven't yet made it into these big biodiversity indicators and that are not really taken too much into account when we think about big global conservation policy and how we can stop biodiversity declines. And yes, so sometimes my research uh, feels a little bit like playing a game of top trumps. Sometimes my research uh, takes a long time talking to a lot of different species experts about their species and how they're doing to compile information across entire species groups, for example. And um, most of the time, it's just great fun. I think the fox has wandered off now. Foxes, the European fox that we, we see in London, for example, least concern on the IUCN red list of threatened species. Hi, I'm Chongling Liu Kane. I'm a PhD student in University College London's Space and Climate Physics Department. I study galaxies and specifically how nearby galaxies grow. Today, I'll be talking to you about galaxies' journeys through time, from their formation to the present day. A galaxy is a collection of stars and dark matter. These stars form out of gas and all orbit around a supermassive black hole in the centre of the galaxy. In an average galaxy, like our own, there are 100 billion stars, or roughly one star for every 10 grains of sand, like these, on the surface of the Earth. What we've got here is the universe about 400 million years after the Big Bang. So it's a bit of squidgy foam for this. And this point in the universe, there weren't any stars or galaxies. There was just some gas, which we're going to represent here with some black sand, which I'm sprinkling over the universe now. Yeah, a little bit more. And the gas in the universe at this time wasn't distributed evenly over it. There were some bits, like over here, that were a bit clumpy. And these clumps had stronger gravity than the area around them. So what happened was the gravity pulled down like this and made the clump a little bit bigger. And we'll do a similar one like over here. And then over here as well. And then these clumps now you can see are a bit bigger and more defined. So that means that their gravity is even stronger. So what happens then is the gravity again pulls down a lot stronger this time. And so the clumps get even bigger again and again and again like this 
So what you end up with is a universe that's full of uh, voids, like over here and here, where there aren't actually that much gas. And then nodes over here, where all our clumps were to begin with, where there is a lot of gas and some galaxies form. And then also filaments, which is just sh shorter bits of gas, normally quite long, between the nodes, where you also get a few galaxies as well. There are two main types of galaxies. The first is an elliptical galaxy, which are generally red in colour and have a shape somewhere between a ball and a sausage. Now these galaxies are almost entirely made up by stars. There isn't any dust or gas left in them. They're also usually very old. The other type of galaxy is a spiral or a disk galaxy, which are usually blue and yellow and quite a bit younger. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, is a spiral galaxy. It's called a spiral galaxy because it looks like it has arms that spiral around each other, where the bright arms are where there's lots of stars, and the darker areas are where there's a lot of dust which block out the light from the stars. The Milky Way is 100,000 light years thick, or 60 to 95 billion miles in diameter, so it's there, and about 2,000 light years, or 11 trillion miles thick. This is the same width to thickness ratio as two CDs stacked on top of each other, like this. And one of the reasons why they're called disk galaxies is that it's shaped like a CD as well. So disk galaxies can look rather different depending on the angle you look at them. Either face on, where you can clearly see any spiral patterns that might be present as they wrap around like this, or if you look at them edge on, where you can only see a little bit of the disk here and then maybe a bulge in the middle like where my thumb is. And you could also see them perhaps somewhere in between, like this. So the main way that galaxies grow is by merging together to create one galaxy that's the size of the two galaxies that merge together combined. So there are kind of two main situations for these. The first one is where you've got a big galaxy, so this could be the size of the Milky Way or about 100 billion times the mass of the Sun and that can merge with a smaller galaxy, as you can see here in red, which would maybe be 100,000 times the mass of the Sun. So what happens in a situation like this is the smaller dwarf galaxy in red will come in on a trajectory like this and then will start orbiting around the larger galaxy like this and it will leave a small trail of stars behind it to make a nice stream that you can see. And then this galaxy will move in closer and closer until it, all, until it reaches and falls into the main galaxy that it was following. And then the stream of stars keeps moving around following a similar trajectory, coming in closer again, wrapping around and creating a blob like this. And the main galaxy in this case is mostly untouched and you can see that here because there's still quite a lot of blue sand that shows through the red sand. So the other type of merger can happen when both of the galaxies are around the same size. So for example, this is going to happen to the Milky Way in about four to five billion years. It's going to merge with Andromeda, which is the closest galaxy to us now. So what happens in this case is the galaxies come in like this, and then at the same time, they move around each other like this, creating nice tails, going around, they can also move through each other a bit, so you get something like that coming where it picks up a lot of stars from the other galaxy. They keep moving around and around, spiraling in, and then after several billions of years, you get a nice stable galaxy that could look a bit like an elliptical or a spiral galaxy as we talked about before and that it would look something a bit like this. And you can t and there's a lot more disruption to both of the galaxies this time, which you can tell compared to the other merger, because you can see that this one in colour looks a lot more mixed than this one. 